Star Trek Picard, was it a successful return to form or a plodding padded train wreck? Find out after this. There you go, that'll do. Easy. Cool, cool. Easy. Right, so uh, Ivan. Start, hey. uh, hi, Ivan's here. Hey. Because he, he lives here. <laughs> um, we, we're, we're going lofo fo today. Lo, lofo? Lo-fi. Lo-fo. 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 We're going lofo. lo fo lo fo lo fo is what that's short for. I see. Yeah, no. Nice. Low-fodality. <laughs> Low-fodality. <laughs> Low-fodality. Uh, I haven't done the whole setup because we're just recording this and, you know, society's collapsing and stuff, so we're, we're going to keep it simple. Um, we have been watching Star Trek Picard every Friday for 10 weeks, having not reacted well. I didn't react very well to the trailer, I don't think you did either. Oh god, no. Um, this was somehow worse than my lowest expectations. It's... I think... I, for, I remember someone saying to me, in fact it might have been you, this, considering the situation we're in at the moment, this could be the last Star Trek we ever get. And for both of us, no, there are people who very much have enjoyed it, but for us, that is a very scary thought, you know? Yeah, it's, it. yeah. I mean, it is, you know, you're standing at this point at the end of the world, maybe, like, you know, all the shops are shut, we're stuck inside. And it's like, that's the last thing that Star Trek does. Mm. And it's 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 a tough one to, we, we need to sort of roll this back a little bit, I suppose, and just sort of explain. Just assume they're gonna be spoilers for this. Oh yeah, um, Just oh, God, assume yeah. there will be spoilers. So, Star Trek Discovery, I was kind of on board with the first season and then it sort of took a bit of a nosedive in the last few episodes because when it did all the Mirror Universe stuff I was like oh this is kind of cool but the last few episodes are kind of like oh, I don't know about this. The second season was kind of bad uh, but it had things such as Anson Mount as Captain Pike mm. who did this, mm. this insanely magnetic virtuoso performance of that and you know revived that character really well. He'd taken over from um, Jeffrey Hunter, he only did it once. Um, and Bruce Greenwood, like it, 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 it was, yeah, it was really nice. And but then it was also kind of like this muddled thing about time crystals and just pulling things out your ass. And, and again, not feeling like Star Trek. But you know, it was what it was. But this, because you know, a lot of us complained. You know, they didn't move the, the Star Trek story forward at all. Mm. And this is the first kind of thing after Voyager to move the story forward. Mm. And I mean, it was all, I mean, it was really awful. It just didn't feel like Star Trek. It's full of these action movie cliches that Discovery was. Um, and it's really padded, full of loads of kind of really jarring, strange moments. Yeah, it was, I think, in some ways, I give it the benefit of the doubt on a few things. Like, I think we're saying when we watched the last episode, the first two episodes, have quite a lot of weird action bits and it very much it looked like Picard was going to be one thing and then it kind of chilled out on the kind of SWAT teams and kind of flips and <laughs> yeah. you know gunplay and then it kind of chilled out a bit uh, in yeah I <sighs> <laughs> well you know I'm trying to be somewhat positive about it but ultimately the show you know, I'm now in a situation where I've enjoyed Discovery more than seeing John Luc Picard in the new Star Trek series, which <laughs> is not something I really thought was. You wouldn't have happen. said that a year ago, would you? Yeah. Um, so, I, will we do a little? So, Picard, how does it start? Oh yes. Okay. So, to, to summarise to summarise the story of Picard, and here's the problem with it. So, I think if we're going to do this, we need yes, we need to summarise. Um, it was 10 parts, and it's essentially a mystery is kind of set up, and then explored. And the whole thing is kind of resolved to a degree. Certain things are left hanging, but um, none of which are a particularly satisfying way. So Star Trek Picard lives on his vineyard in France, mm. and he has two Romulan friends, one of whom is Irish. And um, he is after the events depicted at the very start of J.J. Abrams' Star Trek, so still in the prime timeline but it's set after the destruction of Romulus and John and Picard was heavily involved in that and it seems after a certain point there was an incident where a bunch of synthetic people destroyed the uh, Planitia shipyards on 
Mars. Mm. So they banned synthetics and then they stopped helping the Romulans. So yeah. he was involved in this political situation. It's kind of tarnished his name a bit. And then uh, a young woman appears in front of him and says, I know you, I'm a mystery girl and I could do bag flips because mm. um, she's attacked by Romulan SWAT team. And uh, she gets killed and explodes. And then it turns out she has a twin who lives in a ball cube, which is where the Romulans are rebuilding their society because the Romulans no longer have a home world. They do have an enormous fleet, though. Um, and uh, then that's the first episode. Well, also, Picard is sick. He's ill, and he also keeps on dreaming about his best friend, Data. His bestest best friend, Data. His bestest best my, my best friend, Data. Who was, uh, well, yes, yeah, so we, the kind of dementia that's featured in the last episode of TNG mm. is played out here and said, oh, well, you have that. That's fine. Now, what happens for the following five episodes is people sit and tell each other the events of the first episode mm. over and over and over again. And through those means we acquire new characters, but it's just these insane amounts of exposition where either Picard, usually the format for those kind of four or five episodes was Picard goes to a planet or a place to meet someone, sits down and just tells them the plot. Mm. And then they ask him questions about the plot and then they agree to go with him. Yeah. And that was about five weeks of television. Yeah. It was the the first, well, a lot of the first episodes really had very little going on. Mm. And then they get to a point in the series where it's like, oh, we better, better start <laughs> tidying up <laughs> these stories. And, mm. and yeah, so it goes from kind of dreadful tread, kind of retreading over stuff, you know, re-explaining things and scenes where nothing really happens. And Star Trek, there should be people sit, sitting around or standing talking to each other, but when they're essentially explaining things that we know have happened to other characters without any sort of kind of character dynamics in it. I it, think, that, yeah, this represents the current steward, stewardship of Star Trek in that I think a lot of people, I liked the first J.J. Abrams film, and I don't mind Star Trek Beyond at all either. Hmm. Star Trek Into Darkness was dismal. And a lot of the complaints are it was a bit too sexy and a bit too action-y. Mm. And I think, <laughs> and they've tried to take on board the complaints because their view of it is, well, you know, we're going to have some action. But the reason people like Star Trek is because people like to see scenes of people talking to each other. And that is a really huge misunderstanding. <laughs> like, not, It's not merely about having prolonged scenes of dialogue. They all have to be meaningful. Mm. And, a, and, a, and a typical kind of Star Trek layup is that you, in the first act, you present an ethical issue, and then you discuss and debate and, dipl and diplome that mm. for a second act, and then you resolve it in the third act. So it, it, it isn't just a situation arising that had some backflips, and then the characters explaining that situation to each other verbally over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Which um, is yeah, really what we got in yeah. a lot of ways, and then I can't. Remember, I think it was first episode. The the admiral with the Ad fucking hubris. Admiral fuck. Yeah, who admiral seems to fuck. have to say fuck in every of her. It's, you know, and hey, if people want to say, f if people think what Star Trek needs is for characters to say fuck, fine, it's not the end of the world, but to have one character. Who that that's their thing. Well, that's her personality, is that she rolls out and says, fuck. And sometimes yeah. it's, fuck you. And other times it's like, fuck you, you know, this is fuck is aimed at you. And then it's like, well, this is a fuck of confirmation. Mm. Like, it's, it's just like, yeah, your job is just to say fuck. And and the, thrown... the most se senior character in the whole thing as well. Yes. It's a bit like if, it's like, well, we're going to make Lord of the Rings, but Gandalf's going to say fuck. You know, the rest of the characters, not really sure, but... Yeah, Gandalf is going to Fuck! Be, you shall not fucking pass! <laughs> well, not even that, because at least that's a scene where that'd be kind of useful. Yes. But Bilbo fucking back. <laughs> you know, it'd just be like, well, is that... What does that give anyone? Well, yeah, I don't... Yeah, I'm, I'm fundamentally not against swearing in Star Trek. Uh, like, Data says shit in First Contact, and, and the point of that is that it's a character moment, because mm. he... And I, not First Contact, uh... Generations, I'm pretty sure it's generations. He said, Oh, 
Where is it? First Contact. Oh, I don't really like the TNG movies. I'm not gonna lie. He'll um, confirm it through some sort of graphic. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. I'll just <laughs> slap it on the screen or something. But it's you know, it's about how he's recently acquired emotions, and it's you know, is a, a character moment. Um, and you know, Bones McCoy, if it wasn't the '60s, he would have been mm. swearing all the time because he's like especially this salty old dude. I also liked whenever someone says you're out of your Vulcan mind, it does sound like they're saying you're out of your fucking mind, which <laughs> happens a lot. You're out of your Vulcan mind. Um, so I'm not saying it shouldn't exist. I'm not going to be all Puritan about it. And, and me complaining about someone swearing means, mm. you know, there's, there's probably a problem. Um, and the, the final episode as well, chucked a bunch of F-bombs in there too. And, and kind of really action cliche dialogue. But anyway, halfway through the season, and it's just people recapping the first episode. And that's on top of a recap that mm. Amazon Prime gives you anyway. So you oh, have God, the yeah. extra long recap and then people stand around and explain the dialogue. In, in dialogue, explain to each other what's going on. It's infuriating. So there's this really kind of irritating thing where they acquired this group of characters who we're all constantly told. It's like the Star Trek prequel thing. We're all constantly told why we should care about them, but we don't actually really see why we should care about them. Um, and it's, None of them really have character traits. Like, I keep on calling him Elron, but he's called like Elnor. <laughs> Elnor. He's the, like the elf. Who is literally an elf from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, which... And he's like an autistic child sociopath samurai. Well, that's the thing. He's kind of... he's He kind of, kind of covers the Star Trek trope of kind of person out of kind of social norms, be it a kind of data or a spark or a Odo. Or, you but know. a murdering backflipper. Oh yeah. Because no, like he's just, you know, the, the way he's just like this super cold blooded ninja and it, we're supposed to think it's cool. But then and it's like, there's nothing, he has no character. Mm. He can do flips and behead people and stuff. Raffi uh, vapes. She vapes, um, she calls him JL, which yeah. just is like a crutch for like, we're friends. It's like. And then uh, Doctor One, there's a, a doctor, robot doctor. <laughs> yes, sure robot, ro robot doctor. Title. Who gives a shit? This robot doctor. Also, um, Bruce Maddox, now played by Jordan Peterson. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that, was, that was weird. That they was didn't bring weird. back the original actor for Bruce Maddox, which is fine, which is from the, the episode Measure of a Man. Um, and, and, and that's something that I, I, I think I articulated this to you before. Like, Measure of a Man is like almost a perfect Star Trek episode because it's like they go in front of the Jag. Like the, the, it's about they have to go in front of the Jag um, for for the Federation to justify that Data is is, a, is not a human being but a person in a life form, mm. and therefore Bruce Maddox can't just dissect him and put him back to pieces because of how that you know because he, he has no agency. They have to prove that he's not property, and most of that takes place in a room and is just people talking. Great, it's a perfect little courtroom drama and it's all character motivated. And the, uh, I can't remember her name, but the, the judge advocate um, overseeing the trial is an old flame of Picard. Mm. So they have, like, they have kind of a slightly awkward ex-lover relationship. And then, you know, Maddox is kind of like this spiky prick. Riker is forced to testify against his friend as part of his role as an officer in, in Starfleet and, and Picard has to defend him. Like everybody has these motivations and, and this, this this whole dialogue, it's a perfect little capsule of an episode. And it's a great Star Trek thing because because the whole point of it is, are, ro are androids are robots? Are they life forms? Do they have agency? Are they conscious? Mm. And then you, you have a kind of discussion of that for 45 minutes. The thesis of this show is, wouldn't it be good if we all vaped and had spaceship battles? <laughs> and, and, it, and it takes 10 episodes yeah you know to it, cover that and that's the thing and they're all kinds of weird you know like i think with raffi there's an attempt to kind of add some character where for five minutes she goes to see her son and they i like, don't love you mother and then and that and that dis and that's it <laughs> yeah that's never referred to again we know nothing more about it after those kind of five minutes were over. We haven't talked about the Romulan twins <laughs> as a ma male and female Romulans who are twins or brother and they're sister. They're double, double spies yeah. and yeah. evil spies, but they're also in love. But then he, you know, he's a honey trap for robot girl. And, and, and then there's kind of Romulan Apocalypse story, and yes. there's there's the board cube, which is being run by the Romulans, <laughs> and they're trying to unborg Borgs, but this it's not the, really it's clear so why. It's so hard to 
recap it, isn't it? It's, it's a really fun. difficult show to recap because it was very hard to focus on because it was so meandering. But then it just throws all this stuff out, a lot of it that wasn't really tied up. Oh, yeah, end. and, and like, stuff that has no purpose. Like, mm. they go off to see Riker and Troy. It's nice to see them, yeah. but it hasn't got anything to do with anything, you know. Yeah, it doesn't have any bearing on the plot. Yeah, we get to find out they have a pizza oven, <laughs> grow their own tomatoes, yeah. you know, their son died because he couldn't get a robot brain thing. Their son, they've banned and the then Federation of banned robots and their son, they've got two kids, but their son died because he had a special disease that can only be cured by looking at robot brains, but there were no robot brains available because they're all banned. And um, Yeah, and for a bit, it kind of thought, or I kind of thought, oh, okay, maybe this is going to come up. And this will create a conflict between Troy and Riker and Picard on how they view things, or maybe, you know, uh, but no, nothing. It, that never gets brought up again, the no. positronic brain stuff. Or... And also just, this is another thing of, firstly, I just want to say like Jonathan Frakes, is just like this charisma machine. He's a and big I, bag of fun. He's yeah. a big bag of fun, and I just want to see him in all this stuff, and I love that he's getting work directing New Trek again. Good for him. And him and Mar- Marina Sirtis does her best kind of Troy for a really long time, and those two together have got great chemistry. Someone else did Troy better. <laughs> right, well, I've been, here's the thing. I've been avoiding the casino episode, because we're going to get, well, maybe we'll get to it now, but... The first episode has been described to you. The following four or five episodes are the same thing over and over and over again until they build their shit team of wankers. Yeah, we haven't... We haven't sorry, and Karen. then... And then the whole thing grinds to a halt because they have to go on a special mission to a casino planet. Yeah. And, and, why and it's, was that again? What, like, where in the run? No, why did they have to... It's called Freehold or... Free something. It's to yeah. get Bruce Maddox, I think, So I think that's where Bruce Maddox is. Oh, yeah, is. they're searching for Maddox. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Bruce Maddox now, it might as well be a completely different guy. I mean, it literally is a different actor who, mm. who is played by Jordan Peterson, who was awakened from his coma <laughs> specifically to <laughs> appear in this. And, um... A, 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 like, he's completely different and he ends up dying anyway in this episode. But the gang lord's lady of the Freehold planet looks exactly like Marina Sirtis in the 90s to a really distracting degree. And it's just like, what is what? And every, everyone I've seen speak about it or the things I've read, everyone agrees. Everyone's like, and then someone comes up who looks exactly like Marina Sirtis. And it's so fucking weird. It's strange. It's, it's And it's not, because of course it's not mentioned because it's not what's, what's written. Yeah. But some <laughs> casting agent has just done that and it's like, what? <laughs> like what? Um, Seven of Nine turns up around this time. Uh, Seven of Nine, I guess, because she's been out of the collective for long enough. She's not very Seven of Nine anymore, and she's like, "Hey, no. I'm an alcoholic mercenary." They've turned her into Little Warhorse for fans of the Predator, um, the Predator live stream that you probably haven't watched. But um, she's well, like, she reminds me a lot of Starbuck in Battlestar Galactica remake. It's right. kind of okay. tough talking, you know take no shit kind of character sure. and as we're just you know and that's fine characters grow while we're not seeing them which is what we'd expect it'd be strange if they're all kept stuck in aspic but as we discussed you know wouldn't it be nice if seven of nine kind of when she returns we see her a bit like janeway the kind of maternal figure she had who taught her so much and that kind of would give... Instead, we see her adopted son getting his fucking eye pulled out of his head. That's the opening... That's the open of the scene, uh, the episode, oh. I think. Uh. And it's like, yeah, great. Uh. Star Trek. It's, yeah, it's, oh, <laughs> God. Because it's both her... This is what I... This is what and I she hate. is great. You know. I get, Jerry Ryan's a fucking treat and she deserves better. She, and bless her, like, seeing her social media and stuff, she's so excited to be back in it and everything. And she's just great. I'm a huge fan of Jerry Ryan. I think she's a fucking great actor. Um, and she's, you know, she's got all this kind of warmth and charisma. Mm. And, <laughs> like, the, the thing, the, in all revivals of things now, you have to bring the character back and just let us know that the intervening time has been an absolutely miserable fucking mess for them. Because, like, the Troy and Riker, like, they, their son's fucking dead. And then, mm. you know, um, what's his name? Each, like, from Voyager, Seven of Nines, you know, crew of, of x board kids, uh, the boy. He's been oh, fucking yeah. horribly murdered. Oh, that was it, because the gang boss from the Freehold Planet done it, because she collects Borg implants yep. and stuff. Um, still not getting to the worst thing about the, 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 the casino episode. Oh, and also... 
in following characters having a bad time. You know, Picard is isolated in his vineyard. Everybody has, hates him. Yeah, Starfleet, you know, have no interest in him, blah, blah, blah. But sorry, worth it. Yeah, yeah, so every, it's, it's the classic, it's your fucking Star Wars Force Awakens thing, and everyone's just had a shit time and it's sucked, and it was, you know, everyone's been miserable for years. And, and it's face again, it, uh, where's the optimistic Star Trek shit? I know that might become a bit of a cliche, but this was miserable oh, but and grim. For our dark times. It's, it's got to reflect our dark times. It's know? not like the 60s when everything was going great, <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly. You know, you can't just pander to these people. You've got to show them, you know, the real world in their show about utopian post post capitalist future like exactly yeah. so sorry this review this review <laughs> is taking on the structure of star trek picard <laughs> just for verisimilitude when they go to the casino planet they go in disguise right and there's uh, they go in disguise to the casino planet the captain of the ship they have whose name i can't remember and we'll get to him <laughs> oh my god he goes dressed as like a pimp yep like they, they're they pretending up. they've got seven of nine being a fake prisoner like chewbacca um i can't remember the rest of everyone's disguises whatever but jean-luc picard from france admittedly played for years by a british guy and that was always hand waved as uh you know universal translator stuff mm. does a wacky french accent and has an eye patch and is dressed like a kind of comedy French resistance guy. And he's like, I have bought you a Le Borg. And it is one, it's just one of the worst things I've ever seen that character do. It is so, you know, because in a way that episode's a bit of a breath of fresh air because it's just so different to the It's episodes. the first one that isn't a five hour recap, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and but the tone is just so different. And then that accent is just... You know, it's something you expect from like a, oh, I don't even know, um, you expect it like in Dumb and Dumber, you expect <laughs> one of the characters to do a French accent like that. It was the closest I've ever seen Star Trek be to a low, a low. Mm, and, and, mm. and Star Trek does have multiple episodes with Nazis. Yes. <laughs> and this was still more like a low, a low <laughs> than any of those. Um, yeah, it was dismal. It was just head in your hands, just like, what the fuck is this? Um, the, pre the, the preceding kind of five episodes, they basically find out that Bruce Maddox uh, built, finally was able to build ro robots, androids, sung type androids, mm. and did a secret planet full of them. And the problem is that this ties into a Romulan doomsday myth that uh, if robots are created, they're going to summon the double robots that will come and destroy the universe. Yeah, millions of years ago, there were amazing double robots that, oh, I don't know, some, this is the thing, it's, you know, I appreciate both of us have holes in our understanding of Picard, mm. but that is because it, it was such hard work, it was like, you know, God bless you, people who enjoyed it and kept the thread going, but it was, it was effort to try and be like, okay, what's going on now? And why is this relevant to what's happening in the general story? There's some sort of robot apocalypse <laughs> that the Romulans are worried about. So the secret Romulans, not the Tal Shiar, the... The, the Vak Dash or something? Vaj, like Dash. The, there's a double Tal yeah. Shiar. If you're into your Star Trek lore, there's a double Tal Shiar called the Vak Dash or something that was created to present the robo -po prevent the robo apocalypse because when they make robots, one of them is called the Destroyer and that will summon double robots. Yeah, and so that's this really important thing in Rom Romulan society that has never come up before and we've never even heard of super secret Vaj Taj or whatever. Um, and then there's also a Romulan with sunglasses who's the head of Starfleet Intelligence? Yeah, it's not Section 31. She is, she's, actually, yeah. no, she's, actually a, she's actually a Star Trek Admiral. Mm. A Star Trek? She's a Starfleet Admiral who's been posing as a Vulcan who's mm, actually yeah. a Romulan. And, uh, it's just and it's the, the only person in the Federation who wears sunglasses, as far as I can tell. Yeah, and it's this really jarring thing because there's all this stuff like they've been trying to justify in Instagram threads and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, dude, it, w it was just weird. <laughs> it was so weird when she walked out in these sunglasses with the massive ears and it added nothing. 
Because the thing is, on Vulc Vulcans have the ability to, they have like double, not eyelids, but like they, their eyes are great for dealing with hot sun because it's a desert Like cat planet. eyelids, the kind of, the transparency kind yeah, of. I, hmm. Yeah, so they, they go on a sunblasted desert planet, so they don't need sunglasses, they can cope in extreme light. And Romulans can't. So, but it's not like, like why wouldn't everyone be wearing sunglasses then? Because it's just a sun, that's just a sunny day. Yeah. That's like as a super secret clue that it's a, she's, a, she's a Romulan. Um, and it seems to be this far-reaching conspiracy that they've seen it in Starfleet, but it turns out at the end, it was just her. Yeah. And she turns up with the Romulan fleet. She it's just, just like, seems oh. to wander off. Yeah. She just sort of fucks off. And it's like, yeah, now I'm with all the Romulans. And yeah, so, okay, so Casino Planet, Casino Zone. <laughs> the Casino yeah. Night Zone. <laughs> yeah, Casino Night Zone. And then, I don't know, what happens after that? Do they go back to... Maybe that's when they go to the Borg Cube. Oh yeah, that's... they go to the Borg... The thing is, I just can't recap the plot. Yeah. It's just such a fucking chore, and, and it feels like nothing happened. They brought back Hugh from from iBorg, the classic episode of iBorg, and, uh, and he just fucking dies. Yeah, yeah. He sort of, he handholds around the cube, then he just dies. And For it's like, while. oh, he made a sacrifice. It's like, well, I, I know nothing about him. You mm. know, and that was, I thought that was going to be... That's who I'd want on Picard's crew, not a bunch of fucking randos that, you know. Yeah, you know, a bunch of characters we're meant to kind of grow fond of rather than characters we love. And to be fair, you know, it's nice that it wasn't just essentially all the characters from TNG, but also at the start, there's a great hand wave of that where it's like Picard goes, well, all my old friends would come with me at the drop of a hat, which is exactly why I can't ask <laughs> yeah, any yeah. of them to come with me. All my friends would help me, but my phone died, bro, and I can't text them. <laughs> it's pretty much like, because why don't you call Jordy? And it's like, no, no, I'm going to get a crew of randos <laughs> together and get them to do it. And yeah, there's, so the pilot of the ship, which I forget what it's called, is this kind of <laughs> nihilistic, bearded, The cool pilot dude. of the ship is like a human embodiment of the first paragraph of the Wikipedia article on, existent on a nihilism, yeah, yeah. basically. And they, they pan across like, you know, if, if on Wikipedia there's like a list of nihilist books, they just left them out and pan across them from time to time. He's like, I like nihilism. If you asked like a first year philosophy student to write a cool character for a story, <laughs> He's he's essentially what that is, and he's so here's the thing like the concept with him is that like because he's experienced trauma relating to the the robot malarkey and the betrayal from the Romulans and stuff, right? Mm. So he, I think he watched his he watched his captain commit suicide um, owing to having murdered some innocent robots when they made first Rabbits. contact. What's happened is it's his ship, and um, his personality is fragmented across the ship because he has a crew of holograms all based on himself. Mm. And the idea is that they all have British Isles accents, or is it like one Spanish There's a one? Spanish one, yeah. Because because he couldn't do Welsh, mm. but the good news is he couldn't do Scottish or Irish either. <laughs> but it didn't stop him. Um, it is, yeah. <laughs> you know, the Irish one particularly <laughs> really offended me. Well, that was to you. To me, like the Scottish one was just like. And the thing is, is I'll tell you what. Okay, so basically, he English, Irish, Scottish, Spanish guy, right? His English accent's really good. Mm. So like there's an EMH, so there's an emergency medical hologram, there's like an engineering hologram, there's a hospitality hologram. His English accent's really good. And I was kind of like, he might be English for all I know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if he's American English, because that's really good. The Irish one is like, there's an infamous episode of, of Star Trek called Up the Long Ladder, which is just this dismally offensive version of Irishness. This was like, ah, oh, well, no, he's really sad and he loves his nihilism, so he does. And it's so shit. However, when they did the Scottish one, the joke was that the Scottish dialect is nonsense. Mm. And his nonsense phrase, there are so many existing Scottish phrases you can say in a thick dialect, ask my mum, that would be impenetrable to Americans. But when they come to do that noise, he just went, wibbly wobbly wibbly woo. Yeah. And it was just like, <laughs> like wow, like fucking wow. Um, and then there's a scene where they all get together in a room oh. and, and figure out what his problems are. And it's like, that's a good idea. But the execution, and whether it was necessary to this story, and the execution of it, like, 
you know, because it's like the psychoanalysis thing of, of a house representing someone's psyche, right? Mm. It's, it's a take on that, but it was handled so poorly. And the fucking Irish accent on that guy. And also, you know, if you were to be on a ship and someone's, all their emergency holograms were themselves, you would think they were, a, you'd be like, so you could have made them look like essentially anything in the universe. Four Kelly Brooks. Yeah, four <laughs> Kelly Brooks. But you decided to have them all look like yourself. Mm. That would, that's a red flag. Dude, and it's like, it's, it's like, they're jerking you off, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and they, you're reading your existentialist books of being jerked You're off. watching them play shirts and skins, <laughs> basketball, <laughs> in your off time. In, yeah, in the engine room, <laughs> you're in a high-packed chair, just strumming in the corner, smoking cigars. Mm. You know, because Star Trek had a thing, there's a line in TNG about like how people abandon tobacco, but no, cigars are cool, so you have to have cigars. Yeah. So he smokes a cigar because he's cool. Like, Seven of Nine drinks whiskey because she's cool. And also, Doctor, uh, at some point, we find out that Doctor's a double agent. So, doctoring person who seems like a kind of nerdy geek and has never left Earth before, uh, Romulan, Vulcan, Starfleet uh, Admiral, turns her and is like, okay, you're going to be a super spy for me now, and you will murder your mentor slash... Slash lover. Yeah, slash lover. And it's just like... And, and so she does. She kills him. And it's just like... This is just some weird rando who, who you've shown a vision from the past of the future when the super robots come. She fe she gives she mind melds with her and transmits the, the 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 double robot vision. And it's like, really, is this how the Vajtaj do everything? They just find a random scientist <laughs> and are like, oh, you're going to be a double agent now. You're going to assassinate that person for us. And she gives her a big blue Jolly Rancher so they can track her. Yeah. And there's a great scene. We made both play the same joke. She gives her this huge thing and she immediately pops it in her mouth. And the joke is like, no, I didn't say eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in your shoe. Like, <laughs> also, in terms of this show's storytelling, so I do really want to talk. I don't want this to be too kind of wanky about lore and stuff. But it's just a storytelling. So, for, so what happens is, she's Bruce Maddox's lover. She's made by the Vajtaj double Tal Shiar to kill Bruce Maddox. She a kills Bruce Maddox in front of the EMH who watches the whole thing. Yeah. But then doesn't tell anyone when he's when he's up and about. And I don't think she like wipes his memory. Mm. And then also when they find out what she did, they all sort of go, "Now, nah, all right." Yeah. And then it, then it's kind of they they hand ring for about half an episode. Then it's just forgotten about. Yeah, so then later on when they go on the rib Ribbit planet, the robots. she's like, oh yeah, robots, I'll help you out. I think robots are great. <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, cool. But girl robot, I'm not calling them androids or anything, they're robots. <laughs> robots. <laughs> uh, who knows this stuff, knows what happened, at no point goes, oh yeah, well, you know, she's a double agent who murdered her boyfriend. So he was the father of your society. Yeah, so <laughs> you're sure you want you want to take her into your confidence, or? Uh, that, that is all just forgotten. Yeah. And by the end, you have the scene where they're all a crew together. Um, also, when they finally get to the, ro the robot planet, it turns out that Bruce Maddox has been working with uh, uh, Professor Sung's son, who was also played by Brent Sp Spiner. What, a secret son? A secret son. In Star Trek? In Star Trek. A secret relative in Star Trek? I've never, I don't think, can you recall of any other instances where someone's had a secret relative that's never, never mentioned in Star Trek? Well, like a secret Vulcan relative. A secret Vulcan or relative. Or a secret human Vulcan relative. a secret relative. human Vulcan relative. Yeah, or can you think of a any? a secret Klingon relative. A secret Klingon relative. Uh, no, anything or anything no, like that? No, I can't, no, I can't either. That's never happened <laughs> in Star Trek before. Played again by Brent Spiner. Who kind of acts sort of, he's great as well, he's yeah. a treat, he's like a great actor. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a bit much, the, the androids and his and the son that was never mentioned is doing exactly the same job and is basically the same person. Mm. Um, and, and, Scarily, so. Yeah, and, and it's just like, well, okay, and I thought it was, it kind of acted, they made it look a bit like he might secretly be Law. Mm. Never really found out what happened to Law, other than he got shut down, but then it's like, well, you know, did he, what happened to that? Yeah. Uh, but it turns out it's not, he is just Professor Song's son. Yeah, um, and so there's a bit of kind of like, oh, is he evil or has he got a different thing? And yeah, and so the robots <laughs> want to call down the double robots, uh, but the double Tal Shiar <laughs> don't want them to. So they're coming to the planet, but 
the planet has giant space flowers that it can fire at They've ships. made robot flowers that they can send out <laughs> into space to fight space battles. And, oh, and <laughs> when they get to the robot planet, uh, they get given a tool. And oh yeah, they get given like a magic wand. They get given it, a sonic screwdriver. Yeah, they get, it's essentially, it's like, oh well, why don't you just hold it and think about it fixing the thing and it'll fix it's the thing. It's literally a sonic screwdriver. Yeah, and then 20 minutes later, it's like, oh yeah, oh what, we need some sort of super mirror hologram thing. Oh well, we've we've got the sonic screwdriver. And she goes, one of the you know famous things from Star Trek is the Picard <laughs> maneuver, which is where um, Picard made the stargazer appear to be in two places at once, it's confusing a vessel and <laughs> this, her, Picard and Doctor Girl are piloting the ship, and she kind of goes, "If only there was a way to appear in more places at once than you actually are. You could call it a Picard maneuver. Wait a minute, that's a real thing. Mm. It's called a Picard maneuver. If I use the screwdriver and think about it, I could do a Picard maneuver." And they make the Romulan fleet think there's a hundred of their ship, and that's, I mean, my version of the dialogue is not far off. Yeah. Of what actually happened. If, Apart from Picard says something to her, I forget what, and oh she goes, God. make it so. Yeah, for no reason. It's, for no reason. It's not as bad as, you know, the Khan reveal in yes. Enter Darkness. Yeah, but yeah. it's on similar territory. It's, of, it's weirdly unprompted and she doesn't know him. Yeah. Like, she's like not he, like... He, we, we think the audience said know that's his catchphrase. Yeah, and we he might have said it once that. on the ship in Picard mm. but yeah it's like it's just yeah it's, it's really I don't want to call it fan service but it's for the audience in a way that doesn't seem to make sense in the story mm. that, that's such a strange thing to do well, it's, yeah it's I it just because uh, Patrick Stewart was the exec producer on this and was in the writing room and it feels like it, and I think mm. some of the the amount of sway he had on Nemesis is why that was so shit. And it's and I got to say his performance it doesn't really feel like Picard to me. That it still it still feels like that kind of that sort of level headed sort of diplomat scientist is gone. Mm. And again, this interpretation of Star Trek is that well, people like people talking, so it's mostly Picard going. You please, please have to help us because it's sad and bad. And, mm. and he does that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Whereas instead, you should have him having kind of, he had these long kind of soliloquies and stuff that he used to do. And, and yeah, and you know, he's, he's still very good in it, but it, does, it feels like the movie Picard rather than the series Picard. I think in the final episode, he starts to get some dialogue that feels a bit like old Picard, where, mm. you know, he's kind of trying to morally justify things. And, yeah, and some, you know, that, I was like, oh, that's nice. That's that's kind of like Picard stuff, you know. Mm. But in the, you know, the nine episodes before that, didn't feel like there was any of that stuff, you know, really at all. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is dogged by, I think, because it's by Secret Hideout, not Bad Robot, and Secret Hideout's Alex Kurtzman's thing, which is essentially a spin-off of Bad Robot. And it seems to carry forward that kind of ethos of storytelling, and it's where stuff just happens for the sake of happening. Mm. You know, it's so much, it's just stuff just happens all the time, except for the first five episodes where nothing happens. But things yeah. just sort of happen. And kind of mysteries being not revealed, but kind of... Uh, unwrapped mm. so it's like ooh what what might this lead to and then it's like oh well it doesn't lead to anything so like one of the starting well like the sickness one of the starting things we have is Picard sick so that kind of gets mentioned for two episodes we don't hear about it and then about episode eight it's like oh yeah Picard's really sick and it's like, oh yeah, I forgot about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I forgot about <laughs> you know. So he is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then um, uh, robots, robots, robots being bad, and it's yep. like, oh, they've been banned, big explosions, blah blah blah. I think maybe fifteen minutes before the end of the final episode, it's like, oh yeah, well, robots are fine again. Yeah. And oh like, god, and that was the whole yeah. sort of that was the whole central thing of the series. There were, you know, like you're talking about a good Star Trek story. There was no kind of 
ethical alternative, you know, it wasn't a kind of moral kind of, oh, well, I think this, but I think this, we're going to discuss it and it gets resolved. It's like, oh, they're fine again. It's like, okay, well, yeah, great. But how, how, how was that a theme <laughs> in your series? <laughs> okay, Measure of a Man is an entire episode. And in this, and would you like to tell the boys and girls, Ivan, why robots are legal again? Well, <laughs> that face and noise is absolutely the right face and noise. So I, myself, like quite a few other people, thought, okay, Picard's going to die in Picard. He'll die in the first series. Surely a 79-year-old uh, Shakespearean actor doesn't want to do more Star Trek. He'll die, they'll name the ship the Picard. And then Star the Trek rogues, Picard. yeah, the rogues gallery that we love so much from the last ten episodes will get to have crazy cool adventures. So, <laughs> final episode, Picard sick. Remember, you might have forgotten because we haven't mentioned it for nine <laughs> yeah. episodes. But. but he's sick, and after saving the day, doing his Picard times a million maneuver, <laughs> and and getting Robot Girl to change her mind about. <laughs> we, we, we haven't even got into the tentacles. Oh, God. So, he saves the day, but oh no, his brain's full of ants. He's going to die. Brain's full of ants. <laughs> he dies on the ship, and everyone, all, all the characters who we know and love, uh, who have known Picard for maybe a month, get to have a heartfelt, you know, moment with him as he dies. But, Brett Spiner has been building a robot down on the planet. And in between quite what I thought was quite a nice little kind of limbo scene with Picard and his best friend ever Data, where they get to kind of have a little send off, which I quite like. That was probably the best scene in the series, I think. Yeah, that, yeah, and yeah, that was really quite interesting and nice. But Picard comes back as a robot. He looks exactly the same. Uh, he has no superpowers. He's not got a robot life, so he's going to like live for another hundred years. He'll live for a, about the same time as Picard would if he wasn't a robot. And he no longer has a bra chronic brain disease. So the one, the deus ex machina of literally making your main character a robot. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Which... Is is daring. <laughs> it's daring. It's you know the sheer fucking hubris. The sheer fucking. <laughs> the spoiler for Star Trek Picard is he dies and they make him an identical body without the brain disease and now John Luke Picard's a robot. And and talking about Star Trek being about kind of ethical dilemmas, that I guess that was maybe the final fifteen or twenty minutes of the episode. That should have been a whole episode talking about, is it right to bring someone back as a robot? Is it right to decide how long their robot body's gonna live without, without discussing it with the person and, themselves? And the debate of, <laughs> any of these kind of debates as well, you, you, and there are entire Star Trek episodes about like, you know, is that the same person? Mm. Are you your data? Do you have a soul? Or are you just your body and your brain? Like that, those are entire Star Trek storylines. It happens in the last 15 minutes of the last episode and then they go, well, fuck, that was easy. Adventures, everybody. Credits. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely stunning. It is stunning, stunningly jaw-droppingly offensive as a, as, a, as a resolution to your story. It's, it's just proper sitcom levels of returning to the status quo. It's mm. like, oh, so he's a robot. Oh, so he'll have like white blood. No, he's one of those robots that acts and looks exactly <laughs> to a molecular <laughs> level like a normal human. <laughs> so, you know, oh. it, it, uh, well, I, I, it, I love that you, what, there's the, a big thing. Basically everyone who made this is Sin Blade Runner. Because the mm. main story of this was about robots, and they, they kept, they keep reusing the motif of, of people's eyes. That's from Blade Runner. <laughs> but you know, I'm not the hugest fan of Blade Runner, but it does that for like, the, you know, there's a whole metaphor that's been done there, and it's about how you how you receive things into your eye, how the eyes are the winner to the soul. Do you have a soul? You know, it's it's the winners of perception and all of that. But in Picard, it's kind of like, well, people get stabbed in them and, and look at stuff with them. Because robots. Yeah. I mean, it was so thunderously dumb. We're talking like A-level screenwriting class shit. Like, 
Well, also, um, something I hadn't picked up on, but I saw someone mention, which I thought was a really good point. So, Robot Girl falls in love for Romulan brother. Right, uh, yes. And so, in the final episode, Seven of Nine kills his sister as part of her revenge for uh, Borg Guy getting his eye pulled out. Um, brother changes sides and helps get everyone into Robot Town to try and stop them summoning the Lovecraftian robot tentacles through a portal. He gets wrestled to the ground where he's like, no, stop, don't turn on the transmitter. And then we don't see him again. And he just, that that's the end of his story arc for the last 10 episodes. He's lying on the floor in a kind of nice garden villa. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. in Portugal. <laughs> also, the double robots that, that are going to bring the destruction to all of society, the prophecy doesn't come true, but a portal briefly opens and some tentacles go, rrr, 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 and they close and they go, rrr, 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 rrr. and then that's it. It was set up as this huge mystery and then we just see... It, so again, just stuff just happening. It reminded it's, me of proper kind of... Stuff like Howard the Duck, where it's like, <laughs> oh, it's a portal to the evil dimension. Oh, we turned it off now. It's fine. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. It's, and they've just got the technology to open it whenever they want. And It's because so much bloody stuff happens in the last two episodes that all these things have to be picked up and dropped. Yeah. It's like, oh, the Romulans are coming? Okay, we saved that. Oh, now the tentacle portal's opened. Okay, now it's closed. Uh, are you going to... Uh, you know, turn against your sister because you love me. Okay, you have now. I'll see you later. <laughs> oh, Picard's dead. We better make him a robot. And it's and and the thing such is, speed. they spent the first half of the season running around in circles doing nothing, and then the second half of the season they had to smash everything in as if they were running out of time. Yeah. And it's like, dude, like you did all this, like you you wasted so much time. And it's like someone doing their homework the night before it's due. You know what I mean? It just absolutely. Mm. In terms of its, um, look, you know, in terms of its production value, it's really top notch. It looks very expensive, very nicely done. It, it's in the anamorphic format, which they lean into a fuck of a lot. But modern stuff tends to do that, really. It has that anamorphic look. Um, it's nice sets. There's kind of nice art design. It's, it's mm. fine. You know, the, the new Federation uniforms look quite cool and stuff. And yeah. Whatever. Final um, scene, we get a lovely little Riker bit. Yeah. He gets to talk trash. thing is, yeah, it's great seeing Frakes, but that is such cliche action movie dialogue. Because mm. this is full of people, A, saying the phrase, let's save the galaxy, which is not people, people don't really say that in stuff. That's like a kind of Flash Gordon thing, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and the kind of, I'm going to kick your butt right across the sector. Like loads of like, you know, it, it wasn't Will Riker, it was Duke Laserbolt. Mm. You know what I mean? It was cool because I love him and seeing him do that, like, I'm going to kick you, buddy, crested galaxy or whatever. Like, it was cool because it was him and he was on a redressed uh, Discovery bridge, um, fact fans. And all the ships looked the same. The Starfleet, fleet, yeah, some Starfleet fleet stuff actually happens because only boring neckbeard losers want to see Star Trek stuff in Star Trek, right? Because we've moved on, yeah? That's the thing, because so, Starfleet, we've seen Admiral Fuck, <laughs> Admiral Sunglasses. Yeah and Riker at the end. And that is essentially all yeah. the Starfleet stuff And we they get. turn up with the Starfleet fleet, and it's really frustrating because it's just, I think, I think I've heard there are actually three or four designs of ships, but there are what look like uh, 200 identical sh ships yeah. turn up. Um, Which is really, feels very weird when you see it, because it's not how that kind of thing goes usually. And also Riker being captain of the fleet is a bit like, he's like, I'm acting Captain Riker at a retirement. And it's like, why? Yeah. Other than the fact it's Riker and you think we want to see Riker, which we do because Frakes is great, but it's like, that's that that doesn't serve the plot. That's for us. Mm. This is for us. This is it's member berries. You know, like do you remember fucking Star Trek? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, on the other hand, it's like well, the the plot. You know, the kind of story you've created is a loving couple. You know, who have kind of retired from society, have lost a son and have a daughter they care for very much. That character's now gone, oh, I just got a space call. I'm gonna fuck <laughs> off right now into a massive feder yeah. <laughs> Federation Romulan war zone. A huge fucking war. And all of you, you know, my wife and my daughter are gonna be completely cool with that, presumably. And it's like, no, well, actually, you've created a situation where 
we should have that kind of play out rather than, okay, I'm here now. Well, that's and they think they're being clever here because what happens is the two fleets come, <laughs> the two fleets come face to face, and they they think they're being clever because we're going, oh well, this is modern Star Trek. They're obsessed with space battles. This is just going to be a space battle, and actually the space battle doesn't happen because they, they nice. split up, which was nice through means of diplomacy. But it wasn't really that. They think it was that, but it wasn't that. It was Riker. It was Riker going, "Get out of here! I'll kick your ass!" And it's like that's, you know, how many episodes of Star Trek are two ships nose to nose, and then there's tense negotiations over the screen, right? Like, mm. um, and so the Romulans bugger off, and then Riker goes, "Okay, we're all going to bugger off now." <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, well, now no one's defending, <laughs> you know. This planet of autonomous uh, robots. Also, uh, which is a first contact situation as well, which is what fucking Star Trek's all about. That's something that we kind of were laughing at when we were watching it is that, uh, so Picard's like illness is back for the last episode. Mm. And uh, <laughs> he goes like, uh, he's in the ship with the doctor chick. And he goes like, oh, oh dear, I'm feeling awfully terminally ill. And, she, and he goes, I need to, is it the planet that he calls? He calls the girl on the planet, doesn't he? He's pretty much, anyway, he's like, put me on the comm, oh, I yeah. need to, and, and she goes, no, Captain Picard, one more phone call will kill you, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty much. You're too and, sick. And then he makes the phone call and goes like, oh no, my brain's full of ants. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then they do his death, they all stand. <laughs> You're too sick for a phone call. They all, they all stand around and watch him die, and it is like that sort of like, <laughs> It's like the mole in the South Park film. <laughs> so they stand around watching him die, and then he goes to limbo, and then he wakes up because he's a robot forever. And yeah, and that that so there's been first contact with the robots. They're now safe and part of the Federation. Um, Picard's cool again. Robots are cool again. So girl robot can return to Earth, I guess. Yeah, because she decides not to hang out with the rest of them. Mm. And the rest of them, including Seven of Nine, who's going to hang out with them now, will not be in Starfleet, but will be having adventures. It just, like, it, honestly, it, there are so many things in it that feel like afterthoughts and things that might have even been pickups or kind of patched together i don't know because when the idea of uh, what the main girl she's supposed to be data's daughter mm. because she's based on the kind of his physiology that bruce Maddox yeah was because to, if uh, one molecule of data exists his whole personality exists as well yeah. yeah so basically there's a moment that really fucks me off they're on the the pizza planet with riker and troy mm. Pizza Planet. <laughs> yeah, Pizza Run by time. Pizza the Hut. No, it's run by Toby Maguire. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Pizza Time. And uh, Riker, like, she walks up to Riker and they have a conversation. She goes, and there's this really awkward insert of her going, which she's never done, I don't think at all, in the show. And, and then Riker goes like, who are you kidding? I know that's Data's daughter. I'd recognise that head tilt anywhere. And it's like, that is quite a leap. Not mm. only that, but like, she never did it before or since. And it's this front on thing of her going, Ugh! and then it just cuts. Just, just like, what the fuck, mate? What the fuck, mate? It's, well... What could happen in the story in season two, which would kind of bring faith to the heart for yourself in what faith gonna... to believe? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know what could because it's a situation where the the kind of the table's been set in such a way where it's like I don't know I don't know how how I'd be excited by what's to come. Well, I have no idea. I don't even know what the next season would be. I mean, I have yeah. no idea. And there are definitely people who are excited about it. I mean, you know, great. But it's so weird to kind of be like, oh, there's... Because even Discovery, se season three, it's like, oh, well, that's finally going to be in the future. And there'll yeah, be future stuff. Yeah, that's divorced stuff, from... 
yeah, you know, cool. That would be nice to see. But Picard, it's like, a seven of nines, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another thing. Is that it implied the the uh, the very end scene of the show implies that the characters of Seven of Nine and Raffi have entered into a romantic relationship. Maybe so. Yeah. Uh, it seemed that way. Now, there's never really been much discussion. Like, don't, Raffi's new. She could be whatever she likes. There's never been much discussion of Seven of Nine's orientation. I'm not really bothered about that. If she's in some way queer or whatever, I'm totally fine with it. What bothers me is, I don't recall seeing any hint that they were in any way romantically entangled. Did I just yeah. miss a whole subplot of them well, that's the thing. sort of courting each other or something? There didn't seem to be any chemistry, let alone, I can't, and it doesn't mean it wasn't the case, but I can't recall them interacting <laughs> in any way, no. you know? And um, again, if that had been a subplot, That'd about that informed cool. the characters about yeah. them having this kind of romance, cool. But it just sort of happens, and it's like, right? So now and you've got a couple dynamic on your show as well you have to deal with. But it's like, well, I don't possibly because they they infer it in such a light way. Yeah, they kind of it link, could, they link hands. Yeah, and, it's and it, like, it might not be picked up at all. Yeah, they might true. decide, oh yeah, I won't put it past. That this was a teaser. Show. That was to make you excited about what might be going on, and now we're gonna. You know, or maybe they'll talk about it in the first episode of second series, not talk about it again until the final episode of the series. <laughs> and then they'll both be turned into robots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, st that's what I mean, stuff just happening, because that's just thrown in at the last scene, it's kind of like, oh, wait a minute, I don't recall any kind of interaction that suggested any kind of chemistry or frisson or anything between them whatsoever. Oh, also, isn't... Is Pilot and Doctor in a relationship now? Well, they, 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 they the shag the thing. Yeah, but through, don't they but... kiss in the final episode? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, the whole thing has just been insultingly dismal. Yeah. It's been ins I need to give a shout out to Stu Murray, who, who sent me an exasperated DM on Friday night, <laughs> just going like, dude, yeah, it sucked, didn't it? Like, Stu, I read everything you wrote, man. Like, Stu was just kind of like, what the fuck? And I was just like, yeah, man, I completely agree. Um, yeah, it, it was it was an absolute embarrassing fucking train wreck. But apart from that, I really liked it. Do you know what I want? What's that? Star Trek Miles. Star well, Trek Miles. Miles nice. O'Brien mm. gets to have some crazy adventures. I'm gonna as a war veteran. I'm gonna repurpose a pitch that I put on Twitter a few weeks ago, and that's uh, the Doctor and Garak water park detectives. Oh, and that's that'd my be Star awesome. Trek. Mm. I'd like that too. Be a water park planet. That you know, because that's what's in the future. Wartopia. What? <laughs> <laughs> but lots of people come there by accident because they think it's for war. This flume's at a <laughs> weird angle. <laughs> It'd be like Midsummer Murders, but with Garrick and the Doctor. Ah, oh, they could have like with the roller coasters. They've got the roller coasters. Roller coasters. Thanks for correcting me. They've got a euthanasia flume. So <laughs> <laughs> the G-force makes you pass out and die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah. I would oh, people flock to the euthanasia flume also an abortion flume <laughs> <laughs> don't want to imagine anything about that one <laughs> so what a poke detective what a poke detective Star Trek coming, Miles coming, coming soon to, to Amazon Prime probably yes. <laughs> if you're listening Amazon you know the ideas are right here, man. I do want to mention, actually, that the showrunner for this show, lead writer, is Michael Chabon, who uh, wrote, I think one of the treatment, like, he contributed to the script for Spider-Man 2, and uh, I, I've I've read one Which of his novels. Which Spider-Man 2? The proper Spider-Man 2, oh, okay. the true Spider-Man 2. Um, was it the, the Yiddish Policeman's Handbook? Is oh. his, uh, he did this kind of alternative history, kind of noir novel, and it's about how, instead of really cutting Jewish people to uh, what's now Israel, they gave them Sitka in Alaska and they built it up into this big city and, and it's being repossessed by the American government and that's in the coming days and it seems that like so elements of society are trying to bring around the biblical ap apocalypse and stuff and it's it's a cool, mm. I really like that book, it's a cool detective story and then when I heard when he's coming on with this I was kind of like, oh man, I really like that one, but I've only read the one book, so I really like that one book years ago, like that's quite cool. And then increasingly I see him being interviewed about stuff in Picard 
And one of them was kind of like, why don't you use star dates? And he kind of goes like, well, star dates are just dumb and arbitrary. It's just like a people saying like a string of numbers. And it's like, you don't like Star Trek, do you? <laughs> like, it's, that's kind of the point. It gives it that kind of, the whole point, they are arbitrary because it's that futuristic thing. Yeah. It sounds like you just don't really like Star And there's been a few things where it's kind of like, we didn't do that because it's dumb. It's kind of like, yeah, yeah, you don't seem to like Star Trek. And that's one of the strangest things with franchises where they seem to get chucked to people who have no interest in them. And it's like, well, why are you doing that? You know? Yeah. It's one thing to do that with a franchise no one cares about. Like, I don't know, uh, you know, Airwolf. <laughs> yes, and be like, yes. there you go, Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> you can make an Airwolf <laughs> movie. Airwolf. Yeah. No one cares. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, something yeah. like Star Trek or DC stuff or Marvel All stuff. All the Airwolf or fans are going to be banging for your blood. Oh, oh man, sorry guys. <laughs> those, those Airwolf fans. I, if, man, um, yeah, I, because like Star Trek 2, like Wrath of Khan, they got Nicholas Meyer in, who wasn't a Star Trek fan, and he was able to treat the material with kind of like, they, they refer to it as like a healthy disrespect. Like, because mm. he, he, he clearly was into it, and he did Star Trek 6 as well, he was clearly into it, he did an amazing job of Star Trek. Um, and he'd, written, he'd written the 10% solution, um, which was like Sherlock Holmes meets Sigmund Freud, that thing, about mm -hmm. Freud's, uh, Holmes' cocaine addiction and stuff. And, um, you know, he'd handled these literary characters and he approached kind of Rathacon in this sort of literary way, which is why it's got all that kind of Moby Dick stuff in it. But he was surrounded by people that sort of kept it to the line. And it was a healthy disrespect for it, or, a, you know, a healthy disrespect, not just disrespect or dislike. Which I'm not saying these guys hate Star Trek, but they seem to think they get it, but don't. I mean, you know, a lot of it's written by Akiva Goldsman, who wrote the Scooby-Doo films. <laughs> and, and, like a, and, and I Am Legend. Oh no, he didn't, sorry. Did not James Gunn wrote the Scooby Doo first film? Directed the Scooby Doo films. Oh, he directed it. <clears throat> That's <clears throat> the thing. I do kind of like the Scooby Doo films. Oh, you want to look at look up a Keith Gosman's rap sheet? It's not a good time. Mm. <laughs> it's not a good time. Um, so no, Kurtzman as well. Yeah, fucking Jesus Christ! Like Transformers and stuff like that. Mm. Like, um, yeah. So uh, you, you know, I, it, this was awful. We, 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 went, we ended this 10 minutes ago, but I just wanted mm, to talk mm, about my mm, disappointment mm, at Michael Shabbat. Uh, this was awful, it was dreadful. It was really bad and I hated it, and, and I'm not going to mitigate that in any way. It's really... <laughs> just it's bereft. Just Star Trek. A feeling of bereftness. Well, look, um, we threw this together just kind of quickly as something to do. Um, all of our content has gone remote with people because I'm only allowed to interact with the person I live with uh, owing to UK law. <laughs> so so um, we've got more stuff coming. I'm going to speak to Chris Griffiths about RoboDoc very soon. Um, we've got Gary Smart coming back on to talk about some stuff. I'm not sure quite what yet. Uh, sounds like we might have um, some other guests coming. Duncan sorting some stuff out. We're going to continue doing gaming streams soon. And Duncan and I are going to do a stream, hopefully, of... Roger Corman's Fantastic Four is like a live commentary, so that's exciting. And I'm sure Ivan will be back too because we're locked together in a house for six months. Futuristic prison. Remember that time we were in police <laughs> state for a bit? Wasn't it fun? Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Boy. Support your seventh or eighth favourite YouTube channel by buying crap, tat, junk, hogwash and filth at redbubble.com slash people slash Valverde shop.